The Nerdcast Empire is on the air. We are live on Twitch.tv for another edition of our weekly music podcast called Music Weekly. I am Matt here in the studio, so glad to have you along with us. We are going to be talking about the music from May the 17th this week. We've got another really good slate of music and quite the variety this week, I think, uh, to choose from. So we will be giving you some awesome music takes that uh, you'll be able to pick up some new music releases. And then, of course, in the second segment of our show, we will go into the vault where we will talk about some classic releases that you should get your hands on. I already introduced myself, as always, in the studio, the guy who puts all these lists together each and every week and makes this episode possible. It's Mike. Mike, how's it going? It's going pretty well. And yeah, like you said, a lot of variety out there. I was I was pretty excited about my two picks as far as kind of staying away from maybe what I would normally choose and still getting two really quality releases. I think any time that you can kind of go outside of what maybe your comfort zone is and yet still find really good music, I think... That, that makes it more fun, I think, to to be able to have that variety of good music. Joining us from Parts Unknown is Chris. Chris, how's it going? Going all right for now. Uh, about to have some increased work hours in Parts Unknown, but enjoying what free time I have. And like you guys said, there's a, a lot of, there's a heavy dose of a lot of different genres here. And I was happy to add my own little spice with some instrumental, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Yeah, Chris is going to be joining us for the first part of the show, and then he's going to get ready for some of that extra overtime that he's got coming up. He'll be bouncing, but uh, we'll be catching up again with him soon. But as we mentioned, this is the music from May the 17th, so each and every week Mike puts together a list, and Mike will share that list with everybody. That is a playlist on youtube that you can go and you can click on and it'll have all the songs that mike has pulled for may the 17th so you can make your own list of releases as you see right there in the chat and then of course uh we go through pick our six favorite new releases in this case it's actually going to be seven we'll talk about that in just a few minutes and then of course in the vault uh we talk about some classic releases each and every week but a lot of good stuff this week. Let's get right to it. We're going to start off with Chris. As we mentioned, he's got to uh, take off after uh, talking about his two new releases, but we wanted to get a chance before we had to go to, to talk about some really awesome new bands and get a chance to play some clips of those new albums. So, Chris, what is your first pick this week? Yeah, I mean, plus I feel like Mike has earned himself a little bit of a break from kind of starting these off. He's put in a lot of work being numero uno every Music Monday or Music Weekly. <laughs> Uh, but jumping in for pick number one for me is a band called Sons of Cult with their latest EP, Desolation. It's four songs, 15 minutes from a band from Palma, Spain. Uh, I've covered this band on a very early podcast episode, actually, before this was even a Music Monday or a Music Weekly. I name dropped this band as kind of a, a newer band formed in 2020. They had released an album in 2023 that I found off a of Loudwire's chart. And I was just curious when I looked at them on Spotify and saw I think they had like double digit listeners and I thought that they could easily garner more than just that. And it would kind of surprise me. But originally on their their first album had a sound similar to old school Ozzy and covering topics like you'd expect from Ronnie James Dio. Uh, With this EP, I feel like they've come into their own sound more. Uh, The mixing is better. You can hear everyone much better. And the riffing and solos are still strong. Uh, the singer Jana Villanova has a distinctive, almost folksy voice. Uh, this band isn't trying to reinvent the wheel. They're they're not going to try and blow you away with unrelenting speed. They're sticking to methodical rock, harkening back to the old school heavy metal days, and they aren't afraid to slow things down. Uh, I feel honored to have been introduced to this band at the beginning of its career, even if it's not necessarily the beginning of the musicians' careers, with them having a ton of bands under their belts already. And I feel even more honored to see it grow just in the short time that we've been running this podcast. Uh, With this EP and a few songs from their debut album, Back to the Beginning, there's no reason this band couldn't be opening up for some big names in the hard rock or heavy metal scene, especially some of these older name bands that they're inspired by that are still touring. Uh, Look forward to following these guys, watching them grow their sound even more. Uh, As far as the tracks go, with it being a four-song EP, there's no reason for folks not to check all of them out. Uh, The track that I picked to preview is the opening track, Here We Are, and it was a great choice by the band to put their strongest sound first and really sink their hooks into listeners like me. 
Uh, the title track, Desolation, was probably the track I felt least gripped by. But tracks three and four, Now It's My Turn and Too Late Again, recovered nicely and were a perfect cap off to the EP as a whole. So hopefully our listeners enjoy, and I'll keep everyone updated as I keep tabs on Sons of Cult. So we're going to check out Sons of Cult. This is the uh, first track off of this four-song EP uh, called Here We Are. So let's check that out now. That was Sons of Cult with the first track off of their EP. Uh, Here We Are is the name of that track. Mike, any thoughts on Sons of Cult? Yeah, really kind of classic metal sound to them. Uh, Vocals definitely distinct. I agree with that completely. Uh, Just really accessible stuff. Um, Four tracks, easy, easy to digest. It's definitely worth a listen. Yeah, definitely worth checking out. I think any of these... Four track EPs, it's just really easy to blow right through them. And uh, but I, I do appreciate bands that maybe go with the EP route and, and get stuff out a little more regularly rather than waiting till you have a whole album's worth of stuff and put it out there. Especially in the digital age, you don't really have to wait uh, till you have 10, 12 tracks. If you got four and they're good tracks, get them on out there. So I think uh, sometimes you just kind of want to keep your name out there and fresh in people's minds and and the amount of time it takes to throw down 13 tracks you might be kind of missing out on that no doubt about that i mean we've talked about that a lot on this podcast that a lot of the bands that we feature are bands that are looking for that foothold they're looking to try to find their audience and if you're constantly releasing things you're you're staying in everybody's mind so good stuff check out sons of cult with desolation the uh, first pick from chris this week and i will try if i can keep up to post uh, the link to the YouTube music page with the album for each of these six new releases. Actually, there's seven. We'll see if I can find the link to the seventh one before we get to that. But, Chris, you've got a second pick as well this week. What do you have for us next? Yep, as I mentioned, I want to add a little bit of instrumental spice to this uh, pick list this week. So for number two, I've got a band named Intervals with the latest release, Memory Palace. It's an eight song, 37 minute album of instrumental prog metal. Uh, formed in Toronto, Ontario, Canada by the guitarist Aaron Marshall, created after leaving his band Speak of the Devil. Uh, Marshall's the only official member of the band currently, though in the past he had more official band members that parted ways in the mid 2010s. Marshall does have touring musicians that frequently join him for live shows and recordings, and you can definitely tell this is a project fronted by a guitarist, as Marshall's virtuosity is on full display here. Uh, The opening track, Neurogenesis, is a strong and fast beginning to the album, sounding equivalent in heaviness to a Mick Gordon game soundtrack at times. Uh, The example track that I've chosen doesn't let up on the momentum or intensity with Marshall's guitar filling in quite nice and singing to the audience and covering for the lack of vocals. Uh, Track three, Galaxy Brain, features pianist and keyboardist J3PO in a song that shows how the band can slow things down when they want to and it adds in a ton of jazzy flavor that I could easily see in an anime ED. Uh, Those anime and video game feels roll right into the next track, Side Quest and Circuit Bender with the latter being easily usable as final boss music. It's got this section about three-fourths of the way through the track that I can only describe as villainous, before rebounding back into a climactic and heroic finale. Lacuna and Chronophobia retain that same heavy prog sound and round out the album as a whole, 
And just all around, this is a front to backer in my mind for those that are interested in the heavy instrumental prog sound. So I hope you all take a liking to intervals as much as I have. It feels like it's it, it perfectly encapsulates so many of our nerdy pillars on the podcast. So we're going to check out the opening of the second track, Mnemonic. It is, uh, the uh, release is uh, Memory Palace from Intervals. So let's check that out now. That was the beginning of Mnemonic from Memory Palace, and uh, really good stuff there. Uh, definitely a, a really strong week for instrumental acts. We had uh, three or four on the list this week, and I really thought all of them were, were standouts. Uh, this was uh, just a, a really solid release for uh, a release that is uh, an instrumental release. Mike, your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I I would say crowded week in terms of of instrumental artists. Uh, and I think that that was kind of the downfall. I mean, I enjoyed this, but it's really hard to compete with Marty Friedman in a given week. Um, but obviously, we wouldn't typically just add him amongst the normal picks. But yeah, this stuff, there's no doubt about the uh, virtuosic performances there. Uh, I could definitely have that as background music to a gaming session, for sure. Uh, definitely worth a listen. Yeah, absolutely. I thought it was, uh, again, really solid and uh, Definitely looking forward to finishing that album, getting a chance to go through it all. But good stuff, Chris. Uh, thanks for joining us this week once again, and uh, we'll catch up with you again soon. Try not to work too hard this week at work, but we appreciate you dropping by with a couple of new picks. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me, and I, I might still be floating around in the chat here and there. So thanks again. Big thanks to Chris for joining us on this week's edition of the podcast, and uh, we're going to be continuing on with – uh, this music episode, our music weekly episode, and uh, before we get to Mike's regular picks, we do want to talk about uh, as somebody you just mentioned that has a release this week. We try when there's a band or an artist that is someone that we would feature anytime, whether it's in the archives, in the vault, or, or something new, and they're just a, a mega artist. We try not to lump them in with our new picks to try to save those spots for bands that maybe we're just discovering or maybe people need to kind of know about. But everybody knows about Marty Friedman. And certainly, if you listen to this podcast, yeah. I'd be surprised if you don't know who Marty Friedman is. We were very fortunate enough to get to see him in concert last year and uh, just absolutely blown away. He's got a new album out, and it came out this week, and it's or on the 17th, I should say. Uh, the album is called Drama. It is primarily an instrumental album, but I just had the chance to finish listening to it. I know you've listened to it as well. I, you know, if you are a fan of the stuff that Marty Friedman's done in the recent years, I think you're really going to love this album. I think it is outstanding front to back. There are two vocal tracks uh, on this album, but everything else is instrumental. And again, the guy finds a way to make instrumental tracks not feel boring in any way. Almost, you you still have that feeling as if there are lyrics even though there aren't lyrics i know friedman's uh, you know you're a huge fan of his as well obviously uh your thoughts on on this new release yeah the the guy's just insanely talented for sure uh it, it's kind of interesting some of the earlier tracks definitely have this like soothing and calm feel to them it just it, him, him coming off the heels of playing a couple live shows with megadeth at budokan and then also at vakan it's like you thought maybe his next release might actually kind of bear more of those those metal sounds to them, but not at all. Um, it's not until you get to track four, Thrill City, where you get something a little bit heavier, which is also really cool. Um, 
it, it's interesting. He does have a couple tracks with vocalists, uh, Dead of Winter and Dos Re- Rebeldes, <laughs> I believe, uh, with Spanish vocals. Both are really tremendous as well. Um, the song it, with Spanish vocals, like I said on the Discord, it almost felt like an, an epic ending theme to an anime. Like It just felt like it would have belonged if the anime was in Spanish. Yeah, which, I mean, why not? Sure. Uh, but, you know, if those aren't your things, I thought acapella going into Tearful Confession was just ridiculous. Like, acapella being kind of funny because... You know, that would suggest there weren't any instruments as opposed to, to a guitar, which it is just an extended guitar solo, but it's it's just there's so much emotion there. And then going into Tearful Confession, which again starts out really slow, almost like you can feel like someone actually having to make a confession, and then it kicks into this heavier part, like at that that moment in time, that's when they're facing kind of the repercussions of said confession. It it works so well. Um, you know, doing research on this, I, I saw the original uh, Blabbermouth post talking about uh, the song Dead of Winter, which features Chris Brooks from Like a Storm on vocals. And some of the comments on the Blabbermouth post, just people not enjoying this at all, which... You know, if you only know Marty from his Megadeth stuff and even Cacophony before that, this may not be for you. It's it's definitely a guy that doesn't need to play as fast and hard on every song as humanly possible. Um, which I think if you're kind of a virtuoso like that, you're you're gonna want to branch out and do all sorts of things. And that's been Marty. Like his his albums are all over the place. But uh if you are looking to hear more of his music and you only know him from that metal side, this may not be the one to jump right into unless you have more of an open mind, but I thought it was outstanding. Yeah, I think if you're somebody who hasn't been following his career lately, you've really been missing out on some of his best work. I think uh, he's done an amazing job of of kind of positioning himself as that virtuoso. It, there's so many acts over the years that, that kind of fall into that category you think of someone like Joe Satriani, for example, and some of the music he put out that was, you know, instrumental music that almost didn't need vocals because it was so yeah. they were so uh, stand out without the lyrics. And uh, this is really what Marty's been doing. Uh, he's got a band of young Japanese musicians that just were amazing live, and clearly his uh, decision to kind of influence the next generation of musicians in japan you see it all the time on their youtube show the rock fujiyama youtube page if you're not following that you should be uh but you kind of see them bringing in young artists and kind of getting a chance to let them spotlight themselves but yeah if if you have been following marty in recent years and you've enjoyed the stuff he's put out this is going to be right right up your alley you're going to definitely enjoy it and again don't miss the opportunity to see him live i mean you know he's still obviously doing really well still releasing new stuff but, you know, you just never know, like, at what point he may decide he doesn't want to do full-scale touring anymore. So don't miss the opportunity to see him. This is really great stuff. Um, I don't know if we'd want to try to play any of this stuff. Uh, try to... Yeah, I suppose we could give it a shot. What do you want to hear? Because we ha- I haven't had a chance uh, to get really your... plan this out. Um, this live podcast. I mean, if folks. we want to play something a little heavier, you can play a selection from Thrill City. All right, let's do that. We'll... Uh... We'll find something from Thrill City here. and That might be a little more on brand for us, typically. Up. So we'll mute the podcast version of this, and then we'll we'll get it started here. So I'm trying to think of it. We're just going to jump right in the beginning because I don't have it queued up. <laughs>
So yeah, Marty Friedman, uh, definitely check that out. Great stuff from him. And uh, the album is Drama, released on May 17th. You definitely can check that out. I think you're going to really enjoy it if you are a fan of any of his recent music. So kind of a bonus pick this week on uh, our Music Weekly show. But uh, you've got your two regular picks as well. So let's talk about your first pick for this week. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, over the past several months or so, I there have been a few bands that I haven't picked that I feel like were kind of going for a sound similar to this, but maybe there was a certain element missing that just didn't connect with me. And then I heard the first track off of the off or from this band that I pulled for the list, and I thought, yeah, this is this is finally it. Someone's finally done it. Uh, my first pick for this week is the second full length album from an Arizona horror punk slash metal band. The band is Zombeast, and the album is Heart of Darkness. Yeah, this is kind of one of those groups that has found a way to put it all together. Like you've mentioned, there have been bands over the weeks that have kind of had elements of this and that, but haven't found a way to make it all tie together. And I think these guys may be the ones that finally figured out how to do that. Yeah, it's kind of wild. They've been around since 2005, evidently, and this is their second album. Um, I didn't go into searching really deep for the details, but it sounds like they have faced some some hardships along the way. Um, there was a bio I found on Last.fm from 17 years ago stating that the band formed in August of 2005 by four guys raised on nothing but horror and everything Danzig. And you can certainly hear that. Uh, Seasons of Mist on their website selling the album uh, points out that the band is influenced by Danzig, AFI, Merciful Fate, 80s Punk, Death Rock, and Thrash Metal. You can definitely hear it. Uh, certainly the Danzig in the vocals, maybe with a little a little bit of King, like early King Diamond, like Merciful Fate type stuff without the falsetto. Um, I can hear the AFI and some of the riffs probably more from like the the art of drowning era of AFI but yeah it's it's everything put together in the perfect package that if if Glenn Danzig was around was well he's still around <laughs> if if he was in his prime and and releasing just that classic kind of like Salwin to Danzig early rock this is what I think it would be um it's just it's it's amazing so um on this album, some of the standout tracks we're looking at Devil's Whore, Red Ripper, Torso, Heart of Darkness, Cold Embrace, uh, Dark Path, which is definitely kind of a different feel than the other songs. Um, as far as what we're playing, I think I se uh, selected part of the song Heart of Darkness, the title track. Definitely gives you a good indication of what this band sounds like. Yeah, interested to check that out. Uh, what are, where are we picking this up on Heart of Darkness? Uh, I think I said around 50 seconds. Okay, I must have missed that. Hang on. Oh, there we go. We'll get that taken care of. So we will get that set. So we're going to jump into Zombies, Heart of Darkness. This is the title track. And we're going to check that out right now. Yeah, there's no question there's some Danzig influence in there. I don't think anybody's going to mistake uh, that for, for any other kind of influence. But uh, it's not so much a ripoff as it is a tribute. Like, you can definitely hear other influences in there as well. But uh, they've got a great sound. Again, if you told me that this came from Danzig, I would totally believe it. I, I think... Uh, the influence is very strong, but you can tell that they, they really, you know, really valued the music that was produced in that time and, and wanted to do their best to uh, kind of give their take on that. And I think uh, what I've heard of this so far has been really outstanding. Yeah, I, 
I'm trying to remember where I saw the interview. I want to say it was Metal Hammer, but they were talking to the band and and they basically said that the second album is basically their vision. This is what they wanted to be all along and that maybe before with their their earlier work, they just they weren't quite to the skill level and aptitude to really create that sound, but uh that that interview, if you go through, they kind of go track by track telling you who influenced that track. It it's kind of similar to uh, like Avenged Sevenfold's Hail to the King, where if you listen to each track, you know like kind of which band they're they're riffing on to some degree. It was very much like that. And, I mean, being a fan of all of their influences certainly doesn't hurt. No, not at all. I think it, certainly something there for everybody. I think if you're a fan of those bands that Mike mentioned, I think you're going to find something in this first release from Zombeast, or the first pick, I should say, from Mike, Zombeast, with Heart of Darkness, as always, you've got two picks. Definitely a different direction for pick number two, but another really high quality one. What do you have for us? Yeah, I kind of feel like the second pick is like if you were a band who was influenced by all the other popular music that wasn't the influences for that first band, this is what you would end up with. Um, you know, going through my list this week, the track I originally picked for these guys was just kind of like a really short segue from one track to another, which, you know, you run into with, with Prog Axe. Uh, and after listening to it, I'm like, musically, they got something there, but I just don't, I don't really know what I'm listening to yet. So, you know, I went back and grabbed another track, and I, I just, it was so different, and I knew that I, I had to pick it. There was just no other way. Um, that being said, uh, the my second pick is the fourth album from the Swedish alternative prog rock metal band. Uh, the band is Prehistoric Animals, and the album is Finding Love in Strange Places. Well, this is about to begin a rather, rather lengthy trip to Sweden for us on this podcast, but you're going to get us started with a band, like you said, that is, I don't want to say the exact opposite of the previous band, but certainly uh, a much, much different sound. Yeah, it, it's kind of like, instead of, of getting into you know, horror, punk, and, and metal, and bands like Merciful Fate, you were instead getting into like 80s New Wave and things of that nature. Um, the bio on their band camp describes them saying, what happens when you love classic progressive rock, alternative rock, and brilliant pop music? You make it very hard for yourself, which I thought was kind of funny. But uh, they go on to say that, you know, over the past few albums, they have they have managed to, to get this thing going and, and kind of amass a, a following around it. To me, listening to this group is like listening to Dream Theater if Dream Theater had been influenced more by 80s New Wave and 90s Alternative Rock and not by Iron Maiden and Metallica. Like, there was a clear, like, th there are some overlap there, but then, like, kind of those core elements, you just swapped out one thing for another. Um, it, it's really synth-heavy, but it's got these detuned heavy riffs to them, yet somehow maintains, like, a certain kind of poppy catchiness to it, which I think is cool. Uh, the album itself, uh, the the artwork's done by Matthias Noren, which is really cool. Just kind of has these two presumably robots standing there, you know, in what looks like a, a very dystopic, dystopian type place. Um, and that that seems to be kind of what what the theme of the album is. Uh, I think they referred to it as love, actually, but in like a dystopian world. So. Definitely, definitely a different uh, theme there for the music. Uh, yeah, the theme being finding love in a dystopic future world. Um, and yeah, I, I just, I don't know how else to describe it without just playing the cut. Um, as far as the tracks that I, I thought were really cool, uh, City of My Dreams, Living in a World of Bliss, Secret Society of Goodness. Uh, it's not a long album track count wise, but there's definitely a lot there. Um, the song I picked is City of My Dreams. Um, just kind of gives you a good indication of of kind of the synthiness yet still proggy sensibilities of the music. Yeah, I definitely think you're going to hear that in this track. Again, it is Prehistoric Animals with the album Finding Love in Strange Places. This is from the title, or the first track, I should say, the initial track, City of My Dreams. Let's check that out now.
Yeah, good stuff there. It really feels like at first you really get this early 80s pop vibe to it with the synthesizers and the heavy electronic sounds. And yet, like the vocals and some of the uh, parts of like the chorus feel almost a little bit more late 90s, early 2000s, like rock in that era. I don't know what the what exactly the, the genre of that would be, but there, it seems like a really healthy combination between the two. And like you said, you can feel the influences almost from both eras that have gone to combine into what is a very interesting sound. Yeah, I like how it, it kicks into that heavier chorus. And then on the other side of the chorus, you have this riff that almost sounds like John Petrucci from Dream Theater. Like, it, it's just, there's something there for everybody if you're into those, those kind of elements. And I, it's unique. I just, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I think anytime we can find something that's unique and really good, I, I think it's great to spotlight it on this podcast. So I think we have done that there. Uh, Prehistoric Animals, Finding Love in Strange Places. Definitely check that out. Mike's second pick of the week. As always, I have two picks as well. Uh, really excited about the two picks I had. And really, there was kind of a group of about five or six bands that I was kind of narrowing down to make these two picks. But the first choice this week is a actually both choices are bands from Sweden. This week we are going to go with the band called Freedom with the album Stay Free. No question about it. If you are a fan of Bruce Springsteen, you are going to hear his influence, especially in some of the later tracks on this album. It is very much a blue collar working man's type of music. Uh, but I will say I'm not a huge Springsteen fan, so. When I read that, it kind of gave me pause and maybe I wouldn't enjoy the rest of the album as much. But honestly, it is the Springsteen influence is really more like the brighter Springsteen songs, songs like Glory Days. Like you kind of feel like the whole album is much more of an upbeat type of release. So I did end up enjoying it and didn't kind of didn't persu you know, uh, persuade me to move to a different pick. But, uh, but I also feel like. There's some Talking Heads influences in there, especially the song I'm going to play in a few minutes, uh, which is uh, the song Tonight. Uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, Screamer Magazine said Freedom's music would be the perfect soundtrack to summer campfires on the beach, backyard baseball games, or neighborhood block parties. I, I totally see that. It feels like the feel-good songs of the summer. Uh, and, and it feels, in a lot of ways, very American. I have a clear, it's clear either through their influences or or what they decided to do, like that is a direction, a choice they kind of made. You do hear some Swedish influences in there if you listen to a lot of Swedish rock, which we do on this podcast, but it does feel very American. Uh, just a very 80s pop rock album in a good way. Uh, the standout tracks to me, Love Reaction, uh, which it kind of flows right into Eye of the Storm, which I really enjoyed. Uh, there's a really great saxophone solo and freedom song. We don't get to say that too often on this podcast. Uh, that song to me felt the most Springsteen influence of the songs that I liked on the track. So, and maybe it was the saxophone, very Clarence Clemens type yeah. uh, sound. So, I certainly see that. But we're going to talk about the opener, uh, which is tonight. Very much to me felt like a Talking Heads type of song. So, I think that's why I kind of gravitated to that one. So we're going to check that out. It is the opening track off of Freedom's new release, Stay Free. It is tonight, and we're going to play that for you right now. Even listening to it again, I even maybe heard a little bit of Tom Petty influence and maybe some of his more upbeat, poppy type songs. But 
Uh, just really fun. Really like the vocal harmonies in that chorus, which were really good. But uh, definitely check out Freedom's Stay Free, the uh, first pick, uh, uh, my first pick of this week. Mike, your thoughts? Yeah, my my first impression of this band watching the video was that someone had like teleported these guys out of 1978 and, and into present day. And there's no way they don't have a Springsteen or Tom Petty cover in their live set list. Like that just has to be a thing. I didn't verify, but it, it would only make sense. Um, but yeah, like you, when I heard the Springsteen kind of influence, I that doesn't do a whole lot for me. But honestly, this this feels like the Springsteen sound, but in a weird, more authentic way without the pretentiousness of Bruce Springsteen. So I like it. Like it just it feels more earnest and and valid to me. Um, it's not really a style of rock you hear all that much anymore, and I'm just kind of glad there's someone out there doing it. So, who would have guessed it would come from Sweden? <laughs> and I, when I saw the video, I thought they were from Canada. That was the first vibe I got. It just felt like this small Canadian band that was has been out there jamming away, and then to find out they're from Sweden, it's like, oh, okay. But really enjoyed this fun album. Definitely check it out. Uh, this Freedom with Stay Free, my first choice of this week. We are going to stay in Sweden. We are going to talk about a band that has been around in one form or another since 1982. The band is currently going by the name of Universe 3, and this is the self-titled release, Universe 3. This band's uh, kind of had an interesting path. They were formed uh, in the Uplands Vosby in Sweden back in 1982 as Universe. Uh opened for Nazareth on a tour in the 80s. I think even had some connection to the band Europe uh, during that time. Uh, they had their self-title release in 1985 and then did some demos and a few other tracks before finally disbanding in 1988. Got back together in the uh, early 2010s, mid-2010s, finally released a second album under the name Universe Infinity. Uh, so that album was called Rock is Alive, and then it took a little while longer. They the pandemic hit, and as so many of these bands have had happen, they basically used it as a time to write songs. And and ten of those ended up on this album, where they created Universe Three. Unfortunately, uh, their founding member Michael Kling left the band uh, during this process, so he's not on this album. Uh, but they're getting ready to tour for this album, and I, it's a band you would definitely want to check out. It's just. It's just a great arena rock sound. All their influences come from that era of the early 80s, and there's no question that they would have fit right in with those acts. And it's another one of those bands you look at and think, why why did X band make it and these guys didn't? Because it just feels like a band that should have been a big hit in the 1980s, uh, definitely influenced by the rock and melodic metal scene. Uh, standout tracks to serve and protect. Casa de los Pollos couldn't pass that one up. That was a different sound. It's a great track. It is a great track. Uh, the track Why was definitely a slower rock song. Had some bluesy elements in there. Hanging by a thread, and then the opener, which I'm going to play some of in a moment. Uh, I am. I uh, just really enjoyed that great way to start out the album. But that is Universe Three with their self-titled release, Universe Three. And now we're going to get to hear a little bit of I Am, the first track off of Universe 3. And that, and that is the uh, part of the opening track, I Am, from Universe 3, their self-titled release, and uh, just a uh, really solid album front to back. Mike, your thoughts? I mean, they have a song called House of the Chickens. I mean, when I saw that, I, I immediately had to, to check it out, and it actually rocks way more than I would have imagined. It, it's a really cool track. Um, another one of those bands that... When we look them up, we find out they've been around forever. It, it's so interesting to me. Um, and kind of 
going off of your point earlier, I, I did see in an interview that they were kind of pre-universe in similar bands or in bands with John Norm and Joey Tempest later from Europe, but not surprising with their sound. Like it definitely sounds like they they were influenced by all the same bands that Europe was. So it's not a bad thing. Not at all. And uh, like you said, the sound sounds great all these years later, continuing to put out great music and. Uh, it's another one of those bands that you just wonder why they weren't a big deal like so many of the other bands. I know their first album was a big deal, uh, but really this is a band that should have had many, many albums and had a ton of success. But they're still hanging in there, still doing great stuff. Universe 3 by Universe 3. Check them out. Hopefully they tour sometime in the States. Maybe they can pick up Freedom and then come on over yeah. here in, the, in your second band as well that was also... Uh, from Sweden, the prehistoric animals. So a lot I, of Sweden this week. I just wouldn't have guessed that three comes after infinity in terms of, of the naming convention. Who like, knew? What what comes after infinity? Well, obviously three. Three, certainly. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, hopefully there's not a four. Hopefully three hangs around for a while. This, I'd love to see them maintain the same name for, for an extended period of time. Definitely made the research on the band a little more tricky, but uh, definitely check them out. Check out all the bands we've recommended this week. As... Uh, we always mention we play these clips, but we want you to go out, support the artists. I link to the YouTube music page so you can sample it, but buy the physical releases, buy their merch. Uh, allows these bands to hang around and continue to do great stuff. And if they tour near you, check them out. It's, it's great stuff. Live music is still the best here in 2024. If you're listening on the podcast edition of the Nerdcast Empire, we're about to step aside for a break. We come back, we will go into the vault. Mike and I will give you a classic album that you need to check out. We'll do that on the other side of this time out here on the Nerdcast Empire. Back on the Nerdcast Empire live on twitch.tv slash Nerdcast Empire. You may be watching on the VOD on Twitch. You may be watching on the VOD on YouTube, which I'm going to have to do some work on because I forgot to start my recorder on the roadcast. Actually, the podcast version is going to take a little work. but We'll get that all updated, and that will be out wherever you get your podcasts as it is each and every week. Don't forget to check out our website, nerdcastempire.com. We do have a store there. Get your Nerdcast Empire merch. When you see our posts on social media, again, the best thing you can do, like, uh, share them. Please, if you're listening on Twitch, uh, please follow us on Twitch. Uh, we're looking to eventually get to that point where we can get to monetization. Uh, we need some more followers to do that. I think we have to get to 50 followers uh, to make that happen. So, Please follow us. Please tell a friend. Have them follow us as well. We'd love to keep doing this stuff for you each and every week. We may be back later this week with another podcast. If it is, it'll probably be Thursday. It'll probably be about 7 o'clock Eastern time. Not sure yet. If not, we will certainly be back one week from today for another edition of Music Weekly when we will go into the music of May the 24th. So uh, just about ready to bring May to a close. Looking forward to checking out the music from May 24th, but it's time to go into the vault. And of course, Mike and I each have uh, kind of our path through the vault. And Mike, you're continuing through the alphabet. Last week, we got across the halfway point. Now we're continuing on into the back half of the alphabet. To one of my favorite bands, and certainly if you're talking about bands that begin with this letter, they, they may very well be my favorite band that begins with this letter. But what do you got for us this week? Yeah, you know, that actually makes me really curious as far as what bands begin with the letter O that I just don't own CDs for. Because, full transparency, I have six CDs with bands that begin with the letter O. So, wasn't a whole lot of uh, choosing here. I think 50% of them are actually this band. So, uh, pretty good likelihood this was who I was going to pick. Um, that being said, this is a band that certainly has been classic since kind of the mid-90s on... Um, Influential in my my time as a music fan, especially in the '90s when when your kind of late stage grunge music and alternative music was ruling the airwaves and MTV. But uh, that being said, my vault pick for the letter O is the band The Offspring with their fourth studio album, Ixnay on the Ombre. I I'm a huge fan of The Offspring. I really love their stuff, and uh, they they had the stretch starting really with Ixnay on the Ombre that I thought was just some of the best stuff they produced. Uh, but this was kind of, I don't want to say it was where it started, but this was definitely when they started to really take off in popularity. Tell us about this one. Well, really, the, the album prior to that, not counting Club Me, uh, Smash was kind of like the the entry point for them as far as is really getting mainstream notoriety. Um, 
that was the album that had tracks like uh, Gotta Get Away, Come Out and Play, Self Esteem on it. Yes, that's um, true. I think as far as this album goes, I I think I was probably first made aware of it from the music video to Gone Away, maybe, or perhaps having heard that on the radio, but that was obviously a, a huge song for me at that point in time. Um, interesting thing about this album is it was the first album they released on the Columbia Records label uh, after having a fallout with Brett Gerwitz and Epitaph, which kind of led them to signing with a major label. Um, evidently, they, they had planned on just sticking with Epitaph permanently they were okay with that but they had a big issue with Gerwitz where he kind of evidently tried to sell the smash album to a label on their behalf i think because he knew it would make so much money but uh that definitely uh caused a rift between the two and and they ended up signing with columbia stating that they they would make less money doing that but they didn't want to work with someone who was worse in their eyes than a major record label so i i hope that I, I'm pretty sure they and Bad Religion have toured since then, like more recently. So I have to assume that all that was patched up. But uh, kind of interesting, especially when you have those kind of bands who the idea of signing with a major record label for a lot of them was like, you know, sacrilegious. Like you just don't do that. So that music was blowing up at the time. So you kind of have to make choices and it can get ugly, evidently. It ended up working out for them, as it turned out, because they they did have a string of hit albums coming out of that. But yeah, you're right. A lot for a lot of those bands, uh, their fan base especially would just revolt if they signed with a major label. So the fact that these guys kind of felt like they had to do that, and it ended up kind of working out for them, was, was certainly good. Yeah, for sure. Um, one thing about about the Offspring I've always enjoyed is kind of in that era of of kind of your like skate punk, like hard rock, that that kind of late stage grunge, whatever was we were moving into post grunge era, you felt like music wasn't very serious, like lyrical content wasn't, and, and they certainly have their fair share of, of goofy songs too, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But I thought this album in particular had a few tracks that kind of stood out for being a little deeper than what you're hearing maybe from like a Green Day at that point in time. Um, songs like Gone Away, which is clearly about grieving the death of a loved one a uh, song like song like amazed which was kind of about struggling with depression and just kind of being surprised if you're going to make it through whatever you're dealing with I, I just felt like some of those songs had just more depth than a lot of the stuff at the time and that's drew me to it even more um as far as the bigger tracks on the album uh, the meaning of life leave it behind gone away i choose all i want amaze change the world I mean, the, the album is enjoyable from front to back, but I think those are, are kind of the big ones. Um, kind of your big hit singles would have been Gone Away, I Choose, All I Want. But uh, yeah, just a great album, and it definitely takes you back when you listen to it. Um, certainly would recommend it to anybody. Yeah, just really great stuff. And I think they found a way to have maybe some of the shallower songs, but also, like you said, really hit on some hard hitting topics and actually uh, not, I don't want to say not care that they weren't hits because obviously some of those were, as you mentioned, gone away specifically, but I think they were okay with, with not being afraid to, to take on a more serious topic in a time when that type of music, a lot of times got, didn't, it was much more surface level. Yeah. Um, and I think that's that's something those guys did really well. Like I said, really liked The Offspring, really enjoyed their work in that stretch. One of my favorite bands from that era. Uh, but x on the Ombre, great release. Definitely worth checking out. Some of the other bands that start with O on this website, I found. All right. I know for sure you don't own any Oasis. You know, I don't. Um, What's the Story Morning Glory probably wouldn't be a bad album to own. Um, you know, at least I think that was the one that I would consider owning. Uh, let's see. Discography. Let me make sure I'm not crazy here. While you're going through that, we got the yeah. Obsessed, Octane, uh, Odin, uh, Off-Broadway, Off-Road, Offspring, obviously. Um, uh, uh, one last autograph. One OK Rock made this list. So the oh, Japanese funny, yeah. rock band. Uh, Only Child, Open Fire, Opeth, um, which I'd be shocked if that wasn't one of the bands you own an album. It from. isn't, but I, I could see myself owning an Opeth album. Um, Orleans, which is probably one that I would pick. Of course, they had the hit song Dance With Me from the 70s, so 
Uh, that's kind of a classic. Uh, uh, Outland, Outlaw Blood, Outlaws, uh, Outrage, Outrider, Over the Edge, Overloaded, Oz, and then, of course, Ozzy Osbourne at the bottom. But Yeah, um, what's the story, Morning Glory from Oasis? You had Wonderwall, Don't Look Back in Anger, uh, Champagne Supernova, Definitely, definitely one of their bigger albums. I could, I could potentially see owning that. Um, for what I actually do own, I own three Offspring albums. I own two Orgy albums, which I may or may not be proud to say that. <laughs> and then the Ultimate Sin by Ozzy Osbourne. Those are the six. There you go. So kind of a limited selection, but uh, again, Offspring. Couldn't really go wrong with any of your Offspring albums yeah, this week. It all worked out. So that is your pick from the vault this week. Uh, as you're going through the alphabet, uh, for those who just uh, may be tuning in this week, I'm going through year by year and picking an album. I started a few weeks ago, actually quite a few weeks ago now, uh, back in 1969 with the Chicago Transit Authority album. We are up to 1980. This is the first album that will actually be released after I was born. Uh, the pick last week was early in 1979, so did not qualify. This one uh, came out just in the first couple weeks of 1980, January the 14th, and there were a lot of really good choices for albums in 1980. I've already picked one. The one I probably would have picked uh, is Glass Houses uh, by Billy Joel. It is probably one of the it is the first Billy Joel album I owned and probably one of the first albums I owned. But we talked about that on The Vault maybe week two or week three before I started this year-by-year year thing. So I didn't want to pick it again. So we're going to go with the band Rush with the album Permanent Waves. It was released in January of 1980. Obviously, uh, Rush is amazing. We talk about them a lot on this podcast. Uh, this is a very short album from a number of tracks, but it gives you kind of the whole Rush experience. It starts out with Spirit of Radio, which is one of their all-time great songs, followed up by Free Will. Jacob's Ladder rounds out side one, and then you start side two with Entre Nous, uh, just a, a classic uh, different strings, and then the three-part Natural Science, which includes Tide Pools, Hyperspace, and, of course, the title track, Permanent Waves. But, you know, these guys were kind of in that stretch where, you know, they just come off uh, Rush Through Time. Uh, they're moving pictures is coming up next year, which will certainly be another one that oh, yeah. uh, could very well be picked because um, it's another excellent album. But, uh, but I think, you know, people shouldn't sleep on Permanent Waves. It was really great album that came out just a year before that. Uh, they toured on uh, the single Spirit of Radio, uh, which was released in February. Uh, reached number four on the U.S. Uh, Billboard charts, number three in Canada. But the, you really can't go wrong with Rush. And I think this is a very accessible release because Rush sometimes can be very inaccessible for new fans to get into because uh, – you probably shouldn't give a new fan 2112 and expect that they can get into that, even though it's great. But, you know, with the hits off of this album are very much, I mean, Spirit of Radio is a five minute song. Uh, Entre News is only 437. Free, uh, Free Will is 523. So, I mean, those are pretty reasonably length songs that you could get into for Rush. But great stuff, as always. Those guys are awesome. So, check that out. Uh, Permanent Waves from Rush, uh, my vault pick for this week. Mike, your thoughts. Yeah, it's funny. At first glance, any Rush album just looks inaccessible based on track list alone. You're like, what is going on there? Like, that's not that's not an easily digestible, you know, ten to twelve tracks of three and a half minutes. But uh, they're they were kind of geniuses in how they they divided up what would be the more accessible tracks between albums. I mean, you, you clearly here you have Spirit of Radio and Free Will, and then you move on to Moving Pictures and. There that you got Tom Sawyer and Limelight, uh, Red Marchetta. Um, clearly, it was just like we're not going to let you just pick one album and run with it. Like you're you're going to have to buy all of them, even if you were more of a mainstream rock fan who happens to like their hits. Um, you know, moving on to Signals, you have uh, Subdivisions, New World Man. It's just they managed to find a way to say okay. What are going to be the songs that anyone can dive into, and then what are going to be the songs that that the fans are going to want to listen to, and just economically divide them amongst albums? It was, it was pretty amazing. Well, and I think they may not admit it, but it really feels like a compromise between themselves and the record label to say, "Look, we'll give you a couple of radio hits, but we're going to do, you know, 
La Via's Strangiato. Like we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> we're going to do these just insane songs that are progressive masterpieces that are gonna be twelve minutes, fifteen minutes that are never gonna go on the radio. But the the, the exchange is we're gonna give you the the radio hits so that you can have something to sell that you have something to set up your tours on that these are the songs that are people are going to want to see you can close your concerts with them but you know you can also have 2112 in there and and do that so i i think that's kind of i think when rush transcended just being progressive you know icons to being rock icons where it's now not just you know your prog nerds that are into Rush. Now it can be everybody, and uh, I think people who listen to this podcast know we love progressive music. So certainly we would have been a fan regardless. But you know it is it is all the other stuff I think that allows you to give it even to this day to young rock fans and say hey, check these out. Okay, you like that? <laughs> here's here's something completely different. You know, and, and I think you can get into it. Yeah, and I, I have to assume too on their behalf they probably found what it took to write a song that was artistically satisfying that you knew would also stand a chance of bringing in that crowd. Because, you know, ultimately, everybody loves money. You, you want to do this for a living and make a good living off of it. And, you know, there's nothing, not not even so much about this album right here. I mean, we, we could focus on it, but I just had subdivisions in my, my head. <laughs> like, when you write subdivisions, you don't immediately think this is going to be a huge hit. But... At the same time, you kind of know that there's something about it that that is accessible compared to other tracks. So I think it had to be gratifying to, to write it, even though you also kind of know that it could hit a, a wider audience too. And I think because they had earned the equity by the time Subdivisions had come out, they were now able to kind of stretch what was a radio-friendly track and pull it a little bit more toward the prog end that – they might not have been able to do earlier in their career. By the time you get into those later albums, you know, they, they are able to release something like subdivisions, which is very proggy, but yet also very accessible. And they, they have now created an audience across spectrums of rock that are ready to hear subdivisions and be like, yep, that's exactly what I was looking for on my radio. Uh, And you also still cater to your hardcore prog fans as well. So Rush is amazing. We could spend a whole podcast on Rush. Uh, they're just uh, one of the absolute best. It's still one of my regrets that I did not get a chance to see them live uh, before Neil Peart passed away. But uh, just the all-time, one of the all-time best in yeah. rock for sure. But uh, that's going to wrap things up on this edition of Music Weekly. A big thanks to the guys once again for joining me on this podcast again we may be back with you coming up uh later this week i uh, have to see kind of what the schedule looks like and what our podcasting uh, topics look like but uh if we get a chance to find something to talk about we'll be back with you probably on thursday so make sure you join us and uh, uh well, that's interesting to note that OhioCon's website's back up so that's one of our other nerdy topics maybe that's what maybe we'll... like the website is ohiocon.online so i'm kind of I, I just now saw this i'm kind of curious if this is actually legitimate or not but N- nerdy breaking news at the end yeah. of our podcast uh that is very interesting maybe we'll dig we'll more into that dig more into that maybe we'll have uh, some some news to talk about later in our podcast but a big thanks to everybody for listening uh, for joining us on Twitch Live or on the VODs or on your favorite podcast source, wherever you listen to us, huge thanks. Uh, make sure you go to our Twitch page, though, twitch.tv slash nerdcastempire. Even if you're not listening to it on Twitch, uh, follow us there. We get to 50 followers. We're able to monetize and do more cool things, so please help us out there. Big thanks to Stove Leg Media for their continued support of our podcast. We'll be back with you for sure in one week's time with another edition of Music Weekly. We talk about the music of may the 24th that's gonna wrap things up for this week for the entire crew i'm matt saying so long don't forget to join the empire the nerdcast empire